What a good mantra song to be singing these days. Over the course of Christian history, the saints are those people who have embodied through their lives the spirit of Christ, the love and the truth of Jesus in ways that help the rest of us see it better, believe it better, live it ourselves better. If there's one common characteristic of the huge cloud of witnesses that are the saints across human history and what distinguishes them from the superstars and the heroes and the famous and the powerful is that their lives do not point to themselves, but their lives point to Christ, to God. The saints, wherever they are, whenever they live, and however they conduct their lives, embody the words of the Apostle Paul, it is not I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. They say not, make something great of me or worthy to be admired, liked, and followed, but they say, make of me an instrument of yours. They are instruments of God in a world that at times plays a very different tune than God intended. So more often than not, the saints are those battered and bruised and suffering to produce the music that God plays through their lives. Jesus abandoned, betrayed, executed, being the model instrument himself. It is in weakness, not in strength, that Jesus and the saints reveal God's love to the world in their own weakness and in the way they direct their lives, not towards the strong and powerful, the mighty and popular, but towards the weak and the powerless, the dismissed and the disfavored. It's right there at the beginning when, when Jesus first steps onto the stage of his public ministry in the Gospel of Luke, after his birth, his dedication in the temple, the baptism, the temptations in the wilderness, and then he enters into his public ministry, stands up in his local church, or, which was the synagogue, and, and pulls out the Isaiah passage that Maggie just read for us to describe what he is going to be about and since we know the end of the story, we know this is what is going to also get him killed. I have come to proclaim good news to the poor. Freedom for the prisoners. Recovery of sight to the blind. To set the oppressed free. And proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So this is... Jesus' point and purpose from his own mouth. You'd think with how some people interpret the Christian message that he would have said, I have come to save souls from eternal damnation if they accept me as their Lord and Savior. But that's not there at all in Jesus' own account of his purpose. He is very much focused on transforming the hellish, hellish natures of this world into the heaven that God intended this world to be. And since this is what Jesus was about, this is what the saints are about as well. All the household names of more contemporary saints, Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and then the far many, many more who maybe didn't quite make as global an impact, but, but lived similarly to transform hellish social situations here into more just and compassionate scenarios. So the day after Christmas, December 26th of this year, one of the more globally recognized saints among us died. Desmond Tutu. He was an Anglican cleric who used his pulpit, his incredible oratory skills, his joyful, buoyant spirit, and his commitment to God's grace and God's 
forgiveness, to help bring down apartheid in South Africa, and pave the way for a peaceful, democratic transfer of power, as well as this national process for healing that I'm sure you've heard, read about through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. What an incredible ministry, an incredible human being he was. Not flawless, not sinless, that's, for that doesn't make a saint, Saints are human, but rather he allowed himself to be an instrument of God's love and grace in this violent and troubled world, in the most violent and troubled of situations. A revelation through his life of what Jesus intended and intends for this world. So this morning I'd like to just lift up Five ways that Desmond Tutu's life teachings, his actions, bore the marks of Jesus and enfleshed God's intentions for this world. His teachings are summarized in in a beautiful little book that I really recommend to you called God Has a Dream, A Vision of Hope for Our Time. It's, 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 a pretty, it's a small little book, remarkable to read in this moment, I find, that, that we find ourselves in as a country. And I think we'll go a long way towards reminding you of, of God's love and presence in even the most conflicted and trying of times. Now, there are more than five principles in the book, for, uh, but for this morning, I'm highlighting five for you. And here are the five. It's a moral universe. No one is irredeemable. God has no hands but ours. God cares about the underdogs. And there is no situation that can't be transformed by God. So first of all, Desmond Tutu proclaims that God, who is the creator of this world, who creates order out of chaos from day one and ongoing, has created the universe to have a moral order. And this is the foundation of our hope in the future. It enabled Bishop Tutu to say to the president of South Africa, P.W. Bota, during some of the darkest days of apartheid, that he and other white South Africans should just go ahead and join those of us trying to dismantle apartheid because we've already won. (laughs) Despite the objective facts and the horrible circumstances they were still facing when he was saying this, Tutu maintained this deep confidence that God's universe was a moral one And that as a result, there was no way injustice, oppression, and lies would have the final word. Of course, there were times when you had to whistle in the dark to keep up your morale, Tutu wrote. And you wanted to whisper in God's ear, God, we know you are in charge, but can't you make it a little more obvious? The world has a moral order that will ultimately prevail. All chaos and struggle and doubt aside, we must lend our weight to the moral side of a given situation. Secondly, Tutu proclaimed and insisted, despite the horrors of white brutality against blacks in South Africa, to keep them oppressed and in their place, He insisted that no one is beyond God's grace, that no one is beyond God's grace. That we all have a great propensity for evil and we all have a great capacity for good. No one, he claimed, inspired as he was by Christ's spirit, is irredeemable. Not one of us can say with certainty, Tutu wrote, 
that we would not become perpetrators if we were subject to the same conditioning as those in South Africa, Rwanda, Germany, or anywhere that hatred perverts the human spirit. This is not for one minute to excuse what was done or those who did it, he says. It is, however, to be filled more and more with the compassion of God, looking with weeping, looking on his beloved children with weeping as they are consumed by fear and hate. Desmond Tutu forever held out despite all the hate he got and all the suffering he witnessed, that the only way forward was together, and that the oppression of the blacks ultimately was an oppression of the whites as well, and that love and forgiveness was how they too would be freed. Thirdly, in God's dream for this world, God wants human partners and needs our hands to do God's work. Tutu refers to a statue in France where the outstretched hands of Jesus were lopped off by vandals. And the keepers of that cathedral where the statue stood decided not to restore it saying that it stood as a reminder that God has no hands but ours. Or as the North African Saint Augustine put it, God without us will not, as we without God cannot. God without us will not, as we without God cannot. When a person is naked, Tutu writes, God wants to perform the miracle of clothing that person, but it won't be with a Carducci suit or Calvin Klein outfit floating from heaven. It will be because you and I, all of us, have agreed to be God's fellow workers, providing God with the raw material for performing the miracle that God wants to perform. Fourth, our scriptures make it clear that we worship a God who is the God of underdogs. I'm not saying this is going to play out in wild card weekends, so for those rooting for underdog teams this weekend, God is a God who roots for the underdogs, a God whose concern is for the poor, the oppressed, those on the margins, not the center of society. Those at the center already have their reward. God's eyes and ears are trained for the cry of the oppressed, whether that's the Hebrews in Egypt, the blacks in South Africa, the slaves in our own country, the Jews in Nazi Germany, the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar, and any number of other oppressed people in this world. And if we are to follow our Jesus, then we must hear the cry of those suffering as well. To remain silent is to take the side of the oppressor. We must be, Tutu says, where Jesus would be, the one who was vilified for being the friend of sinners. We must be where Jesus would be the one who is vilified for being the friend of sinners. And finally, I'll end with this one, though there are other beautiful principles that Tutu proclaims as a follower of Christ. Um, and that is, no situation is intractable, but God can always transfigure our circumstances. And as followers of Jesus, as believers in the sovereignty of God in this world, we must believe things can change and that we can be a part of that change. Through love, not through violence. Through love. Tutu writes, 
This is an extended quote from him. God certainly does have a sense of humor. Who in their right mind could ever have imagined South Africa to be an example of anything but the most ghastly awfulness of how not to govern a nation? We were a hopeless case if there ever was a hopeless case. We succeeded not because we were smart, patently not so, not because we were particularly virtuous. We succeeded because God wanted us to succeed. It is because we were so improbable that God chose South Africa and will point to us and say to people throughout the world, see, they had a nightmare and it has ended. Your nightmare will end too. That is the principle of transfiguration at work, and so no situation is utterly hopeless, utterly transfigurable, he says. We must have the calm assurance and patience that faith can give us. We must have the calm assurance and patience that faith can give us, but we must also not be patient with oppression, with hunger, and with violence. We must work to bring the time when history is ready for all people to be free, to be fed, to live in peace. Because as God's partners, we help determine the time frame in which God's plan unfolds and God's dream is realized. Those are just a few of the principles that this Saint Desmond Tutu can remind us of and inspire in our own lives, though he has now died. And so in the face of racism in this country, in the face of climate change and its threat to the most vulnerable people and creatures around the globe, in the face of deeply divided politics of insurrections and deep seething anger in our country, let us train our eyes on Jesus and study the examples of the saints, not far removed from us. And let us be guided by love, grounded in hope, and see ourselves and our lives, as Desmond Tutu named it, as oases of love and peace. For God has no hands but ours in this world. Amen.